entirely possible that there's life on Mars. Uh, astronomers and scientists have for over 100 years speculated about the possibility of life on Mars. From what we know about the planet today, and even in light of our Mariner photographs, there's nothing that precludes the possibility of life on that planet. This is a Mars box, a simulated section of the surface of Mars. The temperature at one end, the North Pole, is 100 degrees below zero. The temperature at the other end, the equator, varies from a comfortable 80 degrees during the day to a frigid 90 below at night. Yet there are forms of life which can not only survive in this environment, but if there's liquid water around, they can even grow. Why scientists believe there may be life on planets such as Mars, and how the search for such extraterrestrial life is being pursued is our story today on Science Reporter. I'm John Fitch, MIT science reporter. Today, we're at the Ames Research Center, south of San Francisco, California, to report on current efforts in the search for life on other planets, the science of exobiology. Ames has a long history of service in the field of aeronautics, but recently, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration has constructed this brand new center for life sciences and has assigned Ames the responsibility for basic research in these sciences as they're applicable to space missions. To learn how scientists here are pursuing their search for extraterrestrial life, we talked to Dr. Richard Young, chief of the exobiology division. Well, I'd say that uh, as long as you're asking the question as to whether there could be life on other planets, uh, I could almost unequivocally say yes, there could be. But as to whether there actually is life on other planets or not, we simply don't know. Uh, that's the object of much of what we're doing, is to determine whether there is or is not. Now, there are several problems, of course, in trying to detect life, uh, not only on another planet, but in trying to detect life on the Earth. Uh, one is to find an acceptable definition of life. What, what is life? Well, things that move around or something like that? Yes. Right? Uh, all right. But you haven't defined life. You've given me an attribute of life. And, and this actually is the way we do it. For uh, centuries, scientists and philosophers have tried to define life, uh, probably starting with Aristotle and even before. And we find that, interestingly enough, that uh, what Aristotle had to say about life and its definition is really no different from what we say about life today. Well, how did he define it? Well, Aristotle pointed out that uh, the difference between the living and the non-living is so subtle that we really can't uh, put forth an ironclad definition of life. It's, it's, it's futile. We really can't. Uh, I think that uh, we can come up with half a dozen different types of definitions that uh, uh, would be acceptable to individual scientists, but certainly would not be acceptable to the scientific community as a whole. So we don't, then, attempt to define life. Uh, it, that's, not, that's not our purpose. But is there, are there anything uh, that you could really agree on? Yes, I think so. I, I think that life as we know it on Earth, has certain attributes that is common or are common to all forms of life. Uh, for example, all life that we know of on Earth is uh, composed of organic compounds, carbon-based compounds, mm. uh, proteins, uh, lipids, carbohydrates uh, are all the common building blocks of life and all life as far as we know. And they all D have carbon in them? Right. DNA is a carbon-based, a large organic molecule that's the hereditary material of all cells uh, on Earth. Now, uh, the question is, of course, can we extrapolate uh, this knowledge, what we know about life on Earth, to potential life on the planet X or Mars? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the answer, I think, is yes, we have to. It's, it's the only common starting point we could possibly have. So we do attempt to make this uh, extrapolation. We assume, first of all, that life uh, all life, either on Earth or elsewhere in the universe, is composed of organic matter and that these organic compounds will have a great deal in common. Mm -hmm. We also assume that all life in, in the universe will metabolize in the same way, well, that what basically, that, that life on Earth does. This means that, it, that it, uh, life on Earth, in order to perform its daily functions at the cellular level, uh, uses up certain materials, uh, let's say glucose, sugar, is one very common uh, substrate 
for cellular metabolism and gives off waste products. These waste products can be in the form of heat, uh, waste heat, uh, a gas, or uh, even a fluid in some cases. They have to have some kind of energy in, in order to right. sort of stay alive. Exactly. Now, uh, th this gives us something to look for. We can look for either the disappearance of a substrate, if we know what the substrate is, or we can look for the appearance of the end product of metabolism. But the basic uh, phenomenon, the metabolic phenomenon, should be common to all forms of life. The third criterion that we feel should be uh, common is that of reproduction. All life must reproduce itself in, in order to survive as a function of time. Uh, in order for evolution to proceed, we must have reproduction, either at the cellular level or at the level of the entire organism, so that we would look for uh, increases in size and increases in numbers of something as a function of time. Uh, these three attributes, we think, then, are about as fundamental as we could possibly get. But just because things like, uh, work that way on the Earth, I mean, that everything is based on carbon compounds and, and these other characters, characteristics that you mentioned, why should it be that way anywhere else? Yeah, well, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a hotly debated item, of course, <laughs> but uh, we use the following logic, that in the universe there are many millions or billions of stars. Uh, since we have that many stars, there's no reason to think that some fraction of them, at least, wouldn't have planets around them in the same way that our own star, the sun, does. Uh, some of these planets, uh, statistically at least, should have environments on them that would be conducive uh, to what we call chemical evolution, to the synthesis of organic compounds, and sooner or later, a living system should logically have arisen on perhaps as many as several millions of these potential planets elsewhere in the universe. These would be places all like the Earth? Some of them would be like the Earth, some of them would be very different. Again, you can only approach it statistically and, and uh, assume that some of them would be like the Earth. The reason for making this assumption is that we know roughly what the uh, abundance of the elements in the cosmos is. We know that hydrogen, for example, is vastly more abundant than any of the other elements. We know that carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are also among the most abundant of the elements. Then as a planet was being formed from the primitive nebula or gas cloud, uh, these elements uh, should be there in their cosmic abundance. Because of the great excess of hydrogen, all of these elements would be in their reduced form. Maybe the best way to illustrate this is graphically. For are you saying then that all the, uh, the planets, for instance, would have started much the same way? So that Yes, I think that... Even in our uh, own solar system? I think that that's probably the case. Uh, the planets in our own solar system presumably arose at about the same time, uh, Mars at about the same time as the Earth, for example. Hmm. The uh, atmosphere of Mars, the primitive atmosphere of Mars then, should have been very much like that of the Earth. Uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen in their reduced form. It might have looked something like this. Uh, ammonium, methane, water, with perhaps an excess of hydrogen. Now, in this primitive atmosphere, there was certainly a great deal of energy available. Uh, energy from the sun, for example, in the form of ultraviolet uh, radiation. Uh, energy in the form of lightning in the primitive atmosphere, as is illustrated here. Uh, these sources of energy, when imposed on an atmosphere of this type, give us a situation that we can actually simulate in the laboratory. Mm. And later, uh, I'll show you exactly how this sort of thing w uh, works in the laboratory. Then we, can, uh, we have found, uh, this and certainly other laboratories have found, that when one does irradiate uh, this sort of an atmosphere with any of these kinds of energy, even heat, that organic compounds are synthesized. And we can look at uh, the primitive Earth as having oceans, which were essentially a dilute organic soup. And all of the basic ingredients of living systems were there before uh, a living system actually arose. And of course, there's a, there's a big gap in our knowledge as to what could have happened. Where did the first cell come from? Uh, conceivably, something like a coacervating process or some uh, uh, condensation of polymers present in the primitive ocean could have produced a very uh, rudimentary uh, counterpart of, uh, of, what, of a contemporary cell. These things then would begin to metabolize, producing new gases such as oxygen, free oxygen, into the atmosphere which would form an ozone layer shielding out the ultraviolet light that was uh, responsible for many of the original syntheses, but allowed then biological evolution to proceed uh, by shielding out the ultraviolet light, which would be lethal to many of our biological processes. So some system like this uh, may be a reasonable pathway along which life on Earth uh, arose. 
and perhaps, uh, and we have no reason to think that it would not have also happened on some other planet, such as Mars. And, and you can uh, actually simulate this in the laboratory? Oh, yes. Hmm. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think probably the best thing to do now would be to take you uh, into the laboratory and show you exactly how this sort of an experiment uh, can be done to produce organic matter. Oh, fine. Now, in this particular laboratory, we've put together a device with which we can actually simulate the, uh, the, the chemistry involved in this primitive atmosphere. Now, what we've done here is simply taken a two-part flask. In the upper part of the chamber, we actually introduce a primitive atmosphere, uh, methane, ammonium, water, uh, vapor, hydrogen. In the bottom of the flask, we have our primitive ocean in which we hope to ultimately collect our primordial soup, uh, the end products of the experiment, the right. organic matter that's synthesized. In the upper part of the flask, we have four electrodes projecting into the flask, and uh, these, when they're turned on, which we'll do here in a minute, uh, will uh, create a spark which jumps the, the gap and simulates the lightning. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, uh, as the reaction uh, proceeds, organic matter which is synthesized is carried down into the primitive ocean, as presumably it was on, on uh, the Earth. Aliquots can be drawn off uh, for analysis. Okay, can we try it? Yeah, let's uh, see if we can open the hood here and demonstrate this. Now, we'll turn down the light a bit and turn on the oh, yes. electrodes. Right. And you can see uh, lightning has, uh, is done in the flask. And then uh, presumably these organic molecules are falling down into the ocean. That's right. That's uh, right. They fall into the ocean and accumulate there, and uh, this is probably the way it happened. Well, how do you tell uh, if they're there and, and if they are, what they are? Well, we have to take a sample uh, and analyze it chemically. Now, this mm -hmm. can be done in a number of ways. One technique that we use extensively here uh, in uh, Dr. Panaparuma's laboratory is uh, paper chromatography. Now, here's a paper chromatogram. Uh, in which we look for adenine, which is one of the building blocks of DNA. What we do is simply take uh, a few drops of the end product of an experiment like this, put it on a piece of uh, the special paper, which is similar to blotting paper, but it's treated specially, put a solvent front, wet the paper with a solvent, which will migrate down the face of the paper as a, as a function mm -hmm. of time. Now, whatever material, organic matter, is present and is soluble in that solvent will also migrate down, and it'll migrate at a rate which is, uh, uh, is uh, a characteristic of that particular molecule. Mm -hmm. Then we'll turn the paper over and do the same thing in uh, another direction oh. so that we'll even further separate the components of this original spot. See? Mm -hmm. Now we have a whole series of dark spots here on the paper, each of which is an organic compound. The particular one that we were especially interested in in this experiment, as I said, was adenine. And uh, you can see it was, uh, the yield here was rather high. There was a lot of adenine synthesized uh, in this particular experiment. What is that? Is that and uh, it is important because it is, as I said, one of the components of DNA. And in mm -hmm. fact, Panamperuma has now been able to synthesize uh, practically all of the components of DNA, our hereditary material, uh, not just adenine. And uh, I, my own personal feeling is that uh, DNA will all itself ultimately be synthesizable in this, in this fashion. But just because you can uh, build these um, building blocks and even the DNA, does that mean eventually you can make uh, life in a test tube? Is that no, like not necessarily. Uh, I wouldn't say that's not a possibility, but I certainly wouldn't say that it necessarily is a possibility. As a matter of fact, it may not even be an objective of this type of experiment. Uh, what uh, we're interested in are the pathways along which life may have arisen. And we assume that life is the natural result of chemical evolution. And in understanding these pathways, we may at some later date be able to cast some light on this question of the origin of life. But even if uh, life could have gotten started on the, in a primitive atmosphere in the way you describe on Mars, just as it may have on, on Earth, because they were similar, as you mm -hmm. pointed out, uh, from what we've seen of the Mariner photographs of Mars, it looks like that planet has developed into a pretty inhospitable place. Yes. Is it possible that life could have uh, survived there all this time? Yes. Well, you're quite right. Mars is undoubtedly an inhospitable planet by earthly standards. Mm -hmm. uh, what the biological significance of this is, I don't know. We'll, we'll say something about that in a minute. 
let's look, take a look at one of the Mariner photographs, uh, such as this one. Uh, clearly, from a photograph like this, taken from 4,000 miles or more from the planet, you can't tell much about life on Mars, nor was this photograph intended to tell us much about life on Mars. I think that's the point to remember. From a photograph that wasn't intended to tell us anything about life, <laughs> we should hardly expect uh, to learn much. In fact, from photographs taken from our Nimbus satellite, uh, we can't tell much about the presence or absence of life on Earth. In I fact, see. if we were just to look at a picture like this, uh, objectively, we might be compelled to say there's no life on Earth. Uh -huh. uh, sure. We know better. Uh, we don't really know much about uh, the capabilities of life. When we start talking about environmental extremes, be it on Mars or on the Earth, uh, the extremes of environment on the Earth have been really very little studied. Uh, we've studied samples from soil samples from the top of Mount Everest. We find that, surprisingly enough, there are living organisms in really? these soils. Mm -hmm. uh, so that just based on what we know about the extremes of Earth, I, I see no reason to rule out life on Mars. Uh, it seems entirely possible. But still, I noticed in this um, primitive Earth, you, you did mention the importance of the, of the ocean, and in general, uh, we think mm -hmm. of life evolving out of the ocean. Uh, there aren't any oceans on Mars. Is that necessary? No, yeah, you're right. Water is certainly a limiting factor. We feel that uh, based on what we know about the water content of the Martian atmosphere, uh, from my own point of view, if we can't find ways in which more water than that can be available on Mars, we can forget about life on Mars. There probably isn't any. Uh, in fact, uh, it might be of interest to you, we've built a model uh, in the laboratory oh. in which we've attempted to show ways in which water might be available on Mars, in spite of the fact that we see so little in the atmosphere, and I'd like to show that to you now. Fine. Now, I should start out by stating that uh, you simply can't put a planet in a box. Mm -hmm. But what we have constructed here is a chamber in which we can simulate uh, many of the uh, physical conditions that we know exist uh, on the surface of Mars, and particularly those that have biological significance. We have a heavily insulated box, inside of which we have uh, a second chamber, which is capable of withstanding the stresses of pressure and so forth. The lid here is uh, made of quartz so that uh, we can contain the atmosphere and uh, keep the pressure uh, constant, mm -hmm. and also irradiate in the ultraviolet. The uh, upper end of the chamber, you can see we have a pole cap uh, formed, which simulates that uh, that exists on the, uh, in polar latitudes on Mars. I see, you actually have ice there. How do you make it so cold? Well, this is controlled by the use of liquid nitrogen, uh, liquid nitrogen tanks uh, outside the chamber. Mm -hmm. We right. cycle nitrogen through the chamber and control the temperature at this end at about minus 100 degrees, which mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, approximates that on Mars. The uh, High temperature, the sun, if you will, is, is done by using an infrared lamp, bringing the temperatures at this end of the chamber to, uh, oh, about 80 degrees uh, during the daytime. At night, however, it goes down to extremely cold temperatures, perhaps as much as 80 or 90 degrees below zero. So this is the equator, and up there is, we have the right. North Pole. What are all these little um, aluminum houses or wires? And well, the wires we have in here are actually thermocouples that give us a temperature readout uh, mm -hmm. throughout the chamber so that we know what the temperature is as a function of latitude and as a function of depth in the soil. This temperature then is actually read out for us on a strip chart uh, giving us at any given time uh, the temperature profile. Cold uh, at this end, this is at the polar end of the chamber then, on up to uh, something like 70 degrees Fahrenheit uh, at this end. This scale is in centigrade. Well, that sounds rather pleasant. Yeah, 70 yes. Uh, the only problem is that at night, it's quite different. At night, it gets very cold. And from the point of view of biology, it's a tremendously rigorous environment. Mm -hmm. Now, we've then taken this chamber, pulled a dry Martian atmosphere through it, assuming that moisture was present on the primitive planet, pulled moisture out as it would have been lost to space. Because of less gravity there. Well, a rarer atmosphere and less gravity, mm -hmm. right. The, uh, the uh, moisture then uh, is controlled uh, by these factors. Our objective was to see whether a permafrost layer, whether ice, would be tied up below the surface of the planet since the average temperatures are so much colder, about 50 degrees colder than the Earth. In order to do that, um, uh, we started cycling through Martian day-night and seasonal cycles. And we found that this, by the way, is a longitudinal section of the chamber. We've simply cut it in half longitudinally. Uh, we find that uh, the temperatures at the polar end are minus 100 degrees. At the equatorial end, uh, as high as plus 80 degrees, but perhaps as low as 
minus 90 degrees, cycled daily. We found that a permafrost layer did form, and then a considerable amount of uh, water was tied up below the surface of the planet. This permafrost layer was actually continuous with the pole cap that you can see in the chamber. Uh, trace of water in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide and nitrogen, the primary components of the atmosphere. Uh, if this analogy is a good one, then all you need is a, is a hot spot, if you will, a local hot spot on the surface of the planet, melting the permafrost layer, having water percolate to the surface, and you have the Martian equivalent of a hot spring or an oasis where uh, biological activity may be quite uh, uh, abundant, let's say. Well, suppose you did have um, some life starting there and surviving, evolving. How, how are you going to find out about it? Well. Uh, needless to say, we have to get to Mars, which is a, a major problem. Mm -hmm. uh, once we get there, we've designed a, an array of life detection devices and experiments uh, which will look for these basic attributes of life that we discussed earlier. Uh, we have here some models of, uh, of some of these devices, which I'd like to show you. I think they might uh, serve to illustrate the point. All right. Now, this first device that we see here is called Gulliver. Uh, its inventor is Dr. Gil Levin of Hazelton Laboratories in Virginia. And uh, this is one of several uh, devices that are being designed and prototypes are being built, ultimately to be landed on Mars to send information back concerning uh, life, assuming there is life there. Mm -hmm. Now this one works very simply. What we have here is essentially a bullet, which is fired out onto the surface of the planet. And you'll notice there's a string uh, attached to the bullet. This is a sticky string that unreels uh, onto the surface. The string is then reeled back into the chamber, uh, into a uh, 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 chamber containing a nutrient medium. Uh, it could be sugar as mm -hmm. the energy source. Uh, the string then, being sticky, will pick up whatever adheres to it on the surface, presumably dust or microorganisms or whatever happens to be there. If uh, they find themselves in an environment in this chamber that's hospitable, in other words, if they can utilize glucose, they'll begin to grow. On the top of the chamber, we have uh, a Geiger counter, a Geiger tube, a very simple, uh, common Geiger tube. The glucose that's in there will be tagged isotopically. It'll be radioactive because we'll be using C14 uh, in the glucose. If the organisms utilize glucose, they'll evolve then C14O2, carbon dioxide containing radioactive oh, carbon. And all we have to do is count the uh, radioactive carbon as it's evolved as a gas, as a waste product of biological activity. What if these organisms don't like uh, sugar? Well, then uh, unless we've chosen the right substrate, we're out of luck. The experiment uh -huh. simply won't work. And that, of course, is one of the obvious limitations of this kind of an experiment. You have to guess right about what mm -hmm. the organisms are going to like, and you have to guess right about what they're going to do, uh, what they're going to evolve if they do like the substrate. You could use something else in there. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Now this chamber, or this device, uh, is called the Wolf Trap. It was designed by Dr. Wolf Vishniak in the University of Rochester, well, see where you got the and name. Uh, hence the name. It has a sampler as well, which is bounced out of the uh, capsule itself onto the surface. And these are both full-scale models, by the oh, way. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, this then will aspirate a sample by uh, creating a vacuum, suck a sample of s dust, if you will, into a chamber which might contain a growth medium very much like this one did. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference here is that we're monitoring a different end product. Uh, in this case, we're looking for changes uh, in pH due to the, assuming there are microorganisms, they will grow, they'll change the acidity or alkalinity of the uh, medium. This can be measured by a uh, pH electrode which is in the chamber. So instead of looking for carbon dioxide evolution, we're looking for a change in the pH of the medium. Mm -hmm. Or also, in this, there's a, an optical device wh with which we can measure changes in the turbidity of the medium. If there are bacteria, for example, and they start to grow, they'll gradually cloud the medium so that uh, the beam of light passing through will be attenuated. Mm -hmm. And uh, this information also can be uh, telemetered and give us, uh, hopefully, uh, a direct evidence of biological activity. Now, both of these, as I said, have uh, limitations in that they can really only do one thing or a very limited number of things. Uh, much further down the line, when we have a capability of flying more sophisticated devices, perhaps in the later Voyager program, uh, we would hope to land what amounts to an automated laboratory uh, on the surface of a planet like Mars. It might look something like this, which was 
uh, developed for us by the Aeronutronic uh, Division of the Ford Motor Company. Is this uh, full size? This is a quarter scale model, mm -hmm. so that the ultimate device might be more like the size of this table. Right. Uh, this device has, it is a laboratory. It's a device that uh, will do a multitude of analyses. It has uh, soil probes, which can be used to loosen up the soil if it should be hard. Mm -hmm. It has a sample collecting uh -huh. system, which would actually take a core sample, or it might uh, aspirate a sample the way that one does. It might have a sticky string array. The sample then could be brought back uh, into the uh, laboratory. Uh, stored for future analysis, treated chemically with uh, an array of solvents, extracted. Uh, we have a gas chromatograph in here, a mass spectrometer, an array of spectrophotometric equipment, and it's a laboratory in, uh, in, a, in a modest sense of the word, which we would hope to use on the surface of Mars uh, to, do, to look for evidence of all of those basic attributes that we've been discussing, mm -hmm. chemistry, uh, metabolism, and growth. And uh, it would take a fairly sophisticated uh, device to, to do all of these things, needless to say. Of course, the fact that it is so sophisticated presents other problems, uh, engineering problems primarily. Uh, the reliability of a device like this might be very difficult to compare to the reliability of a device like this. Mm -hmm. So we're really talking about a future generation of, uh, of experimental device here. Well, Dr. Young, aside from the fact that we're naturally all very curious about how unique life is in the universe. Uh, are there any other real reasons for trying to find out about extraterrestrial life? Well, one of the, the, the basic uh, contentions uh, or justifications, if you will, for this sort of work is that we really don't know much about the universality of biology. Uh, the only life we know, the only biology we know is here on Earth. Uh, the only principles of biology that we're familiar with are here on Earth. Uh, the physical sciences, we have universal laws, if you will, mm -hmm. the biological sciences, we don't have them. What we want to know is, as you said, uh, is life indeed unique on Earth? Uh, does it exist elsewhere? If it does exist elsewhere, does it follow the same laws that uh, life on Earth does? Is it made of the same things? Does it do the same things? And does it have a common origin? Mm -hmm. uh, the origin of life, of course, is, is one of the, the most fundamental questions we can be as asking. And uh, I think it's really an underlying theme for this entire program. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Young. Clearly, exploring the heavens for signs of life is no simple matter. Years of research go into deciding just what questions to ask and how to go about asking them. As we've seen, scientists are already hard at work on payloads for a landing on Mars, a landing which isn't even scheduled to take place until 1973. But when you're looking for something as elusive and as ill-defined as life, the payload has to be flexible. And perhaps for conclusive evidence, it will have to be the most flexible payload of all, man himself. Today, we visited the Ames Research Center near San Francisco, California. I'm John Fitch, MIT science reporter.